everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and welcome to the Indie Author Fringe. And my event today is going to be how to use audio as an author for book sales and for marketing. And we're going to go through a load of stuff on audiobooks and also on podcasting. But first, just a little introduction to who I am, uh, in case I haven't met you before. I am two people. <laughs> I write nonfiction as Joanna Penn, and I have a blog and a podcast, and I'm a speaker, and I do all kinds of things for authors. I also write thrillers under J.F. Penn, and uh, you can see some of my books there. I sell around the world, and I also sell in ebook, print, and audiobook format all without a publisher. And I left my day job in September 2011. And so I'm coming up to five years as a full time author entrepreneur. And a lot of the stuff I'll be sharing with you today uh, are lessons that I've learned along the way. But of course, it wasn't always like that. And I just wanted to wind the clock back to 2008. Here's me with my very first book. So if you're just starting out, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this session anyway. And there will be things you can use if you're just starting out or if you're at the point of having lots of books and wanting to expand your income. So just as an overview, we're going to go through why audio and why now, how to self-publish audiobooks with ACX, working with a narrator, narrating your own book, if you fancy doing that, as I have done with uh, one of mine so far, audio programs and how to sell direct, podcasting as an author platform, and also how to pitch podcasters with your book if you'd like to feature on programs, plus some tips on marketing audiobooks. So a big session today, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. And at the end, I will share where you can download the slides with all the links uh, that I'll be talking about in this session. So first of all, why audio and why now? Why is this suddenly such a big deal? Well, the first thing is the smartphone. And I don't know about you, but this is not a phone <laughs> to me. I mean, I use this for a lot. I, I listen to podcasts. I listen to audiobooks, I read. I have my email, I have social media. I do research. I keep my writing notes. Uh, this really isn't used as a phone so much as my computer in my pocket. And that is the main reason why audio is such a big deal. Because of the widespread use of smartphones, uh, in certainly in developed countries, that means streaming audio in your pocket. And certainly my own behaviour as, as a listener has changed over the last few years. I've always listened to podcasts, but up until about two years ago, I would download the audio, put it on my, my iPod, and then go to the gym or whatever and listen. Now the episode arrives on my phone as soon as it's available and I just start listening, whether I'm washing up, doing, you know, going for a walk, still going to the gym, whatever. But generally I'm listening to audio while I'm doing other things. And this is what many people want to do. They don't necessarily want to read a book. They want to listen to a book, maybe on a, a car commute to a job uh, or they want to listen to a podcast. So this is what you've got to start thinking. Even if you personally don't listen to audio books or podcasts, Podcasts. Think about all those millions of people who use audio as a way to keep up with what's going on, as a way to learn new things, as a way to uh, listen to fiction, listen to stories. Uh, you know, these these things are very exciting. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, this is on your phone, so it's very mobile. But secondly, in 2016, um, streaming internet has come to the car. So um, there's a picture there. Apple CarPlay, Google Auto have put streaming internet audio into cars. So now people don't even need to take their phone and have a Bluetooth adapter to their stereo. They can actually download these things directly. So new cars will now have that functionality in. So that's only going to continue to explode. There's also been a big push into subscription services, and that's meant that people are consuming more audio. So, for example, audible.com.co.uk uh, has a subscription service, which means you get one audiobook a month or two or whatever. I have a monthly subscription, so I get a new one every month, and it encourages you to therefore listen more. And also the gamification of listening, which is very exciting. The push into advertising, if you're in the US or the UK, Okay, you've seen how much Audible are pushing advertising to get people into audiobooks. 
The other thing is WhisperSync technology. So again, with Amazon, it's very exciting. If somebody buys your ebook and they have your audiobook as well, what will happen is they can start reading the, the book um, on their phone, on their Kindle, whatever, say they're reading it over breakfast, then they get in their car and WhisperSync technology means that the book will start reading to them from where they left off on the page. Now that's amazing when you think about it. So it's, you know, it, it syncs to where you are in the book. So this bundling of ebook and audiobook is something that also makes the price of audio much lower. Now for a customer, that's really, really good. Um, as a producer of audio, uh, so one day in Budapest, for example, you can see here the pricing of it. Um, they might buy their um, the ebook and this is because I'm in the UK my screen prints of America don't come up with the exact price um, so the Kindle edition of One Day in Budapest is $2.99 or it is uh, £1.99 in the UK and this says you can then add the audio so instead of $22 for the audio it's going to be $2 because you own the ebook so you can see that for a customer this is excellent stuff for a author and for narrators this is driving the profit from audiobooks down but the volume is increasing so you've got to think about audio as pretty much like an ebook going forward it's going to be a similar type of product it should be an easy purchase an easy bundle for the um, consumer. And then we've seen the growth of audio. AuthorEarnings.com reported in January 2016 that 119,000 audiobooks a day are being sold, uh, generating over $200,000 a day for authors. Um, so that's pretty exciting and uh, definitely a market you want to be part of. Goodreads, which of course is owned by Amazon, have added free audio samples to a whole load of um, audiobooks, sorry, ebooks. And you can see there, Girl on a Train has that listen button. So social media sites like Goodreads trying to facilitate audio, audio sharing, audio reviews, audio purchases. And then that um, in the top, uh, as you're looking at it, right hand section, uh, you can see those badges. Now those badges are actually from my husband's Audible account because he really loves to listen to fiction before going to sleep. So while I'm reading, he'll be listening. Um, and he's got these badges. And I love this because it's gamification of reading. Our reading, whether it's with your eyes or your ears, who cares? Or your fingers, if you're blind or whatever, that, you know, these things are incredible. So the gamification of audio listening is a fascinating thing. And I know from watching him use it, how actually motivating it is to get these type of badges. So we, we really need to do that with all kinds of books. Uh, and also this uh, statistic that 77% of audio purchases are fiction. People like listening to a story. And um, that's not surprising if you think about how as a audio culture, people have been telling stories around the fireside and listening to stories for millennia. So you can see why this is growing. And as an author entrepreneur, I'm excited about audio because it has another income stream into my business model. Because as authors, we have a chance to turn our one manuscript into multiple streams of income. So think about it with an ebook, you might sell it on Amazon, iBooks, Kobo, Nook, a whole load of other places. Um, then you might have a print edition and then you might have the audio edition. Then if you multiply that by country markets and then you multiply that by language, you're looking at multiple streams of income from one manuscript. And once you understand this, you see why the, the reasons why you want to start putting your book into these different formats. And of course, you're going to reach more readers. And this is actually a really important thing. There are some people who only now listen to audiobooks. And because you can listen to them on a faster speed, so I listen to most audio on 1.5 speed. Now that might sound quite weird if you don't listen to audio yourself, but you know, the human ear allows you to speed these things up and still understand the content, which is my point. And then you don't, you can do it in less time. So basically, what um, this is a quote from Jane Friedman in a recent Publishers Weekly um, that reader discovery increases when you produce audiobooks and other forms of multimedia because you can reach people in a different place. So someone who might only read you know physically one book a year and actually that's quite normal, they might actually consume audio at a massive rate and that's why it's exciting.
Okay, so briefly, how to self-publish audiobooks with ACX. So first of all, acx.com is an Amazon platform. It's kind of the equivalent to KDP for eBooks. It's at acx.com. And the exciting thing is that we have a chance to use it. The bad side right now, as of March 2016, it's only open to people in the US and the UK. So hopefully, as audiobooks continue to march out across Across the world, um, ACX will also continue to expand. But for now, it's just US, UK. And I'll give you some other options towards the end uh, if you're not in those countries. But the rest of this presentation, uh, after I've shown you this, will still be relevant. OK, so first of all, you, you log on to ACX and you log on with your normal Amazon account. You claim your book either with the ASIN, A-S-I-N, or the name of the book. And then you decide on the contract contract option. So for example, you can pay a narrator up front and keep all the rights, or you can do a 50-50 split with a narrator. Uh, I quite like doing that because there's no money up front, although obviously over time, if you sell a lot of books, the pay up front version is more efficient for you and you'll get more income. And then also the uh, exclusivity option. So if you go exclusive to ACX, which means your books will be, your audiobooks will be on Amazon, Audible and iTunes, then you get a higher percentage than if you want non-exclusive, which means you can also sell it from your website. Then you basically upload a chapter or, you know, a part of the book that will help you decide what the best narrator is. So it might be chapter one. What I would make sure of if it's fiction is that it contains the voice of your main character. So um, if your main character is a woman, don't use a sample chapter that only has the secondary male character in. You want the book to be clear about who the main character is. The, the rule I've heard on this is that if you have a female protagonist, you should have a female voice. If you have a male protagonist, you should have a male voice. But hey, um, you'll get different auditions, whatever, and you'll be the one to decide. So once you upload, say, a chapter in a Microsoft Word document, you will get auditions. Then you listen to the auditions and you decide on the narrator and you agree the contract based on the terms you want. The narrator will then record the first 15 minutes after you've agreed the contract. That 15 minutes is super important because that's the chance you both get to uh, work together. So it's really important to give people feedback in the audition if you're going to choose them because once you get into actually signing the contract and then producing the audiobook, you want to make sure you have a good working relationship. So once you have signed the contract, the narrator will record the first 15 minutes and that's another chance to give them really detailed feedback. So for example, um, you know, say you have an, an Irish character or an Indian character and they've produced that voice with a very strong accent. You can then say, look, I don't want that accent to be very strong. Please just read it in a normal American voice. Um, and I will use the words, say, said, he said in an American accent or he said in an Indian accent or something like that. There have been uh, cases of people who've been very unhappy with their audio around things like that. So very important to communicate up front. Once the 15 minutes is agreed, the narrator will produce the rest of the audiobook and I like to uh, listen as they go. So for example, I will ask my narrator to upload the first 10 chapters and then I will go through and listen and I will email back notes on things that might have been pronounced wrong. And uh, basically when that's done, you QA the files and then you approve. And then the book is available on ACX and Amazon and Audible and iTunes in the next uh, week or so. Very exciting. Of course, the length of the audiobook will depend on how long your book is. Risen Gods, which is here, is around 50,000 words. So it's a short novel. Uh, and you can see here it's four hours, 18 minutes. Now, this was a really interesting book to do because it's based on Maori mythology and New Zealand Aotearoa. And the main character is a Maori young man. So um, CJ McAllister, who narrated it, and I, uh, and I'm not Maori, but I lived in New Zealand for seven years and we also had um, uh, we also got loads of clips of people speaking in the Maori words and we, it was it was a really interesting audiobook to do because he had to, as an American male, was learning to pronounce these words. So it's a fascinating project to do together. 
So I mentioned there a few tips for working with a narrator, but just to be more specific, uh, it's very important to put into your ACX information the type of voice you want and be clear about the tone of your book up front. So for example, a YA romance uh, written in first person by a young woman is going to be very different to a thriller with a male protagonist in his 40s who's African American. So you can see, you know, or you can hear the two different voices almost in your head. You have to specify that up front and that will help you get a narrator. Also be open and honest and uh, if you get an audition and you hate it, just say this isn't a good fit for me. If you get one that you like but there are some issues, tell them the issues up front. You have to be honest uh, in this way. Also Q&A check as you go, so get those five chapters, um, listen to them, make comments, but very important if you want to work with a narrator long term, don't be an idiot. Um, you have to be a good client. Remember that you're working with another professional and this is essentially an adaptation. What you're doing is creating a new product based on your words, yes, but the narrator is an audio specialist. They're a voice artist and you have to respect that. So what I tend to do with my narrators is I will leave a lot of things. Uh, I won't make a fuss about quite a lot and I will only suggest changes if there is an obvious error. Um, for example, there's a, an English place called Blenheim, um, but it's actually my American narrator pronounced it Blenheim uh, because that's how it's spelt. That's one of those place names that can be very difficult. Uh, or the Maori words, like I was saying, there were some words um, that were were wrong according to the, the, the version of the word I'm used to hearing uh, from New Zealand. So Correcting uh, things like that is good. You can also find pronunciations uh, on YouTube and if you just Google a word, you can often find the pronunciation. So I would uh, send that to my narrator. But, but I would not say, uh, you know, some personal attacks or something that w undermines the narrator as an expert. So I think that's very important. The other thing is, uh, top narrators often bring a fan base. So if you want a top narrator for your book, uh, you will be paying a premium rates for that, but they may well bring the sales in return. Oh, and I should just add that if you start with a narrator on a series, it's best to carry on using that narrator throughout the series because they get used to the voice of the book and the voice of the narrator. Okay, so what about narrating your own audiobook? So first of all, I would suggest that if you want to try this, you do it with non-fiction because fiction is a completely different beast. I haven't done my own fiction, but I have done Business for Authors, How to Be an Author Entrepreneur, which is a non-fiction book. So this is me in the studio there. You can see me in the little booth and Andy, my sound guy. Um, so you can find a professional studio near you. Usually in a decent sized city, you will be able to find a studio. They're often very small. They have a box and there's a sound guy or girl and uh, you have to be able to get the production of the audio files to ACX technical standards, which is very important. So you go to the studio, you book it in advance. Um, I did blocks of two hours each because I found it very, very tiring. Um, but some uh, hardcore uh, sort of people who can control their breathing, which I find difficult, may do six, eight hours straight um, of narration. So very important um, to keep your energy up. Um, you need a lot of lip liquid, you know, even as I'm talking here, I have um, water next to me and I'm drinking it because speaking actually does dry your mouth out. So that's important. Also a little tip, if you um, take your Kindle to read from because, or your iPad, you can't read from a book because of the page noises, you have to read from something electronic. Um, turn off the Wi-Fi on all your devices. Obviously turn off your cell phone, but I was reading from my Kindle and we got this um, noise in the background. We couldn't work, work out what it was for ages and then discovered it was the Wi-Fi on the Kindle. So just put it on um, airplane mode. I also found as I was reading my book that there were some things that didn't work well in audio. So I 
essentially edited the ebook on the fly as I was going through it. So when it's your book, you can do that because of course you can go back and change the ebook if you like. Um, if you're narrating someone else's audiobook uh, or if you're getting a professional to do it, you can't just change the book on the fly, but I thought that was brilliant. And then what I would do is um, Andy, the sound guy, would give me the file and then I did my edits. So what you have to remember is you never just do something where you perform or read or whatever all in one take. You make mistakes, you need a break, you will repeat the same word, you'll get something wrong and essentially I would just uh, stop, I would clap sometimes and when you clap um, that creates a spike on the audio so you can see, um, see your mistake and then I would edit that myself because I'm used to doing audio and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but you could use a free, free software like Audacity or Amadeus Pro on the Mac, which is what I use. So what are the costs of doing an audiobook? So if you do it yourself, as I did for Business for Authors, uh, the studio hire, it should be around 30 to $50 per hour. And uh, I was in there for about eight hours for a finished six hour audiobook, um, 300 to $600 for editing, um, potentially more than that, depending on how difficult it is. Um, so for me, it worked out around $800 for my six hour audiobook when I narrated it myself. Now hiring a narrator to do it for you will be between $200 to $400 per finished audio hour. So it's generally going to be between $1,200 to $2,500 for a six hour audiobook. If obviously that and that six hours, that's for a 60, 70,000 word audiobook. If your book is a fantasy 120,000 word um, book, it's going to be double the price essentially. So a fantasy is quite difficult. Um, but equally, people are more likely to purchase a longer audiobook or use their um, Audible credits, their monthly credits for a longer audiobook. So it's a mixed blessing. Uh, of course, the royalty split deal on ACX, which is what I do for my fiction, you pay nothing up front. You just pay half of the royalties to the narrator for seven years. So you have to decide um, where you expect to make your money with audio. Then of course, the other option is to skip uh, Audible ACX altogether and record your own audio and sell it direct from your website. Now, this is actually something I'm going back to. I used to do it um, up until December 2014 when the EU digital VAT laws came in, but I'm about to start doing this again. So essentially you could record, as I'm doing, I'm recording this video in my home, you can record your own audi audio as long as it's decent quality people are fine with that um, but it needs to be decent like you can't have sirens going and all that kind of stuff but you don't necessarily need to hire a studio if you're selling direct then you can use um, it, you know you produce it uh, as an mp3 file and then you use one of these options to sell direct um, send owl gumroad payhip sells ejunkie all of these sites uh, shopify enable you to actually sell your products directly to consumers um, or you can use a site like Teachable or do an online course, that type of thing. So there are options for selling audio without actually going through a site like Audible, which of course takes a quite a big chunk out of your money. So personally, I will continue to do uh, fiction through ACX up until you know, I become a gazillionaire and can just produce it all myself. And then uh, for nonfiction, I'm going to be reading it myself at home and selling it direct. So that's the production side. Let's talk about how to market audiobooks because it's a kind of a different thing than marketing other books. So first of all, probably the biggest thing is your promo code. So when you self-publish an audiobook through ACX, they will send you promo codes to give away to listeners. And the reason you do this is so you can give free copies and uh, people can leave a review, like eBooks and print books and, and anything else, reviews are super important. So you'll get those promo codes. And then the important thing is you can get as many promo codes as you like. At the moment, at the time of recording, there is no limit to the number of promo codes you can get. Um, so essentially that can be really useful 
useful for getting your, uh, you know, for giving away to your audience. You could do an email letter giveaway. You could do a Facebook giveaway and um, actually give those promo codes to your list so that they start listening. Now, a way to do that when you have a series, of course, is to give away promo on the first audiobook in the hope that people will get hooked and want more in the series. The other thing many of us have noticed is if you do a promo for your ebook, like a book bub, you will also get a sales spike in your audiobooks because, as I mentioned earlier, if people own the ebook, they can get the audiobook for a cheaper price. So even though it might not be, um, you know, huge income from that audio because of the special deal, you potentially, if it's first in series, you'll get a sell through. So it's a bit like giving away a free first in series in general. You want people to get hooked. The other thing with the promo codes for Audible is clearly they want people to become Audible listeners. And by giving away those codes, they're encouraging listening, trying to change the culture. It's a very forward thinking view. Um, just give away a lot of audio until people love it so much they can't go back. I also like the site audiobookblast.com, which enables you to give away audio codes uh, to other people on their list of audiobook audiobook listeners. So again, it's a way of getting reviews, early reviews and a sales spike um, with the potential that ACX might notice you and put you on the homepage, uh, which can occasionally happen. Other things to do is use SoundCloud to put clips up. Uh, you can see there I've put Stone of Fire onto SoundCloud. You can use up to five minutes of your audio as a clip and you can put that on your website. You can embed it on social media, on Facebook, etc. So soundcloud.com is great for doing that. Then this is actually brand new. As I record this, it's only just come out. Uh, Audible has just announced clips. And uh, so now you can share directly from Audible on your cell phone, for example. You can share up to 45 seconds of a clip and it will go on social media, it will go on email, it will go on Facebook. You can see there WhatsApp, email, SMS, Twitter, Messenger, uh, Facebook. And the recipient does not have to be an Audible user, but they there will be a link to find out more. So obviously they're encouraging you to share your uh, audio lessons, um, but also the recipient to listen and then they can potentially carry on listening to the audiobook. So this is fantastic and I highly recommend that if you are an audiobook user that you start um, learning about this. If you're, uh, if you're a listener, um, you know, if, if you're a listener, if you're an author with audiobooks, start telling your fans about this because you want to encourage people to share clips and start to spread your audio uh, everywhere. So before we move on to podcasting, here are some useful books if you want to learn more about audiobooks. Uh, audiobooks for Indies by Simon Whistler. Um, uh, Simon is a voice talent and talks a lot about that. Also how to use ACX. Making Tracks, A Writer's Guide to Audiobooks by J. Daniel Sawyer is excellent if you are not in a country where you can use ACX or if you're going to take this very seriously in other production ways. So that's really good if you want to take things a step further than the, than the basic DIY. And then if you want to do narration, uh, this um, book on narration um, is really handy as well. And then I have tons of uh, links on the creativepen.com forward slash audiobooks if you're looking for more information. So let's now talk about podcasting and why podcasting is so amazing. Now I've been podcasting since 2009 before it was uh, a trendy thing and here is why I think uh, podcasting is so brilliant. So first of all it helps you build a relationship with your audience. So the people who've been listening to the Creative Pen podcast for many years are super fans basically. They've been listening to my voice um, for over 260 episodes and considering my episodes are usually between 45 minutes to an hour, uh, that's a lot of time they've been listening to me and uh, I mean some people never even get that amount of time with their spouse every week so that's uh, a big deal. You can really create a community with your voice, um, you know it's very very intimate 
You can also use a podcast and an interview format as a relationship building exercise between you and other people in your niche. And this is actually the reason I started the podcast in the first place. I wanted to connect with other authors and I wanted a reason why they would talk to me. I didn't want to have to pay everyone for consulting. So I thought, okay, if I podcast and I market them, then they will want to do that, right? I mean, it's you have to have some kind of technical ability to do this. So what I found is by offering interviews to other people, they were happy to talk to me because they got promoted. Then often they will link to your uh, podcast. So either on social media, to their email list, if it's particularly good, maybe on their blog or their website. So you get incoming traffic and that will mean that your site is more highly ranked. And then uh, finally, that kind of word of mouth idea. I mean, I'm often talking to people, oh, I listen to this podcast, uh, you know, go and check them out. It's a much more in-depth introduction to a person than just a tweet. It's, oh, go, you know, listen to that podcast and you'll get to know that person much more. And finally, I actually really enjoy my podcast. So it is fun and I get to connect with my community a lot. And also it helps you stand out. Now, there are a lot more podcasts in uh, coming up now uh, because it's become quite a trendy thing and the technology is available and it's much easier. And there's a lot more resources than there were when I started out. But equally, it's still not as prevalent as, you know, if you take the number of people who've written a book, the number of, of those people who've got a podcast is much, much smaller. And of course, if you want to check out my podcast, you can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast, uh, or you can check me out on iTunes or Stitcher, just search for The Creative Pen. And I have over 260 episodes now, uh, so lots to choose from. So how do you actually create a podcast? Well, I've put an exhaustive uh, tutorial under thecreativepen.com how to podcast, so you can go and look that up. Um, But here's just a brief flow. So first of all, you need to plan and I research and connect with my guest. I will email them and I will give them a topic. Then I will email the week prior with a list of questions and reminder of the time that we're meeting. Very important, I think, to be professional around your communication with people, especially if they're higher profile. I, as someone who gets interviewed a lot, one of my pet hates is people not following up and reminding me of things and also demonstrating that they've done their research. It really annoys me when people ask for an interview and then by their questions, they clearly show that they haven't done their research. So um, definitely respect the time of the person you want to talk to. Or if you're doing more of a chat show, uh, prepare in advance the topics you're going to talk about. Then I do my interviews on Skype, so I will record those. I use Ecamm, which is for the Mac and Skype, or you can use Pamela um, to record on a PC. I use ScreenFlow to do my video editing, or you can use Camtasia, you can use iMovie, Movie Maker. There are lots of options. Uh, You can even use your phone these days or an iPad or something like that. Once you've recorded your audio or your episode, you'll need to edit it, and you can use free software like Audacity I use Amadeus Pro. If you're doing video, you can edit again in ScreenFlow, Camtasia, um, and that will give you your finished audio. There are some tools you can use to level the noise, and I explain that in my tutorial. Um, Also, then you'll need to think about distribution, and there are various options for distributing to iTunes, which is the most important uh, platform, but also things like Stitcher. Um, So I use a plugin for WordPress called Blueberry, B-L-U-B. R-R-Y, and that's a great one. It also has hosting. I personally use Amazon S3 for hosting. Now, if all of these words have just blown your head off, don't worry. If you're not going to create a podcast, you can just skip over this. If you are going to create a podcast, go check out that in detail tutorial at thecreativepen.com dash how to podcast. And again, you'll get a link with the slides and all the hyperlinks at the end. So why is podcasting so brilliant for book marketing at the moment? So for one, there are more and more podcasts in all kinds of niches. So you can generally find, especially for nonfiction, you'll be able to find some great podcasts with a great audience. Now, people who listen 
know, like, and trust the person they listen to, especially if they've been listening a long time. So personally, I get a lot of nonfiction book recommendations from listening to podcasts. Uh, Two of my favorites are The Tim Ferriss Show and Unemployable uh, with Brian Clark. And those two podcasts, I get a ton of recommendations for books from because they interview people who I then go check out, then I find their book and that's that's a great way. Uh, Also, a longer interview in the audio sense is much better value than the amount of time you'll spend writing an article. So think about it this way. So you have a new book coming out, let's say it is on business for authors, uh, you know, which is one of mine. And uh, in the olden days, you would do like a blog tour and you would write all these different blog posts. And it's super hard work, actually. And if you think how much time it takes to write a number of different articles, uh, and then versus getting on a whole load of um, interviews on podcasts where you might have a 30 minute interview it's a lot quicker it's a lot more personal it's a lot more in depth and also when it's a conversation people are far more likely to be interested than a dry article on a blog uh, on a blog so as far as I'm concerned, when people now ask me for interviews, I don't even do written interviews anymore. I will only do podcasts because I think there's such better value and a bigger return for the investment of my time. Plus, they're easier to do. If you are going to get on podcasts, the most important thing is this give, give, give. Very important. Provide so much value within the time you have and takeaways for the audience. Always be framing it in terms of what is the audience getting out of this interview? How can I make this applicable for people? And those benefits are what's going to make the person check you out. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the very best bits of your book. It will be more likely to make them check you out. So give, give, give and do not keep saying well you'll find that out in my book Uh, if you say that even once you will turn people off and they will not be interested so the aim is to give so much people think you're amazing and then they will check out your book so if you want to pitch a podcaster and get onto a podcast the very first thing is you must 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 listen to the show Do your research about the host and be very honest. Are you a good fit? Do they even take pictures for the podcast? Um, Do you have credentials? Do you have enough to give to the audience? So again, one of my pet hates. Um, There are two types of pictures I get, for example. The first one is... um, you know, hi blogger, hi podcaster, hello podcaster. Um, I have, I've written a book on financial planning. I'd like to come on your show. I just ignore emails like that. I don't do financial planning. You know, they should be pitching a person. It should be dear Joanna, for example, and they should be only pitching shows that talk about financial planning. Um, or for example, you know, I don't do health and fitness unless it's to do with dictation and standing desks, writing, that type of thing. Um, I'm not going to do, you know, there are lots of things that I am not going to cover on the podcast. (laughs) I'm not going to do how to use spreadsheets or, you know, stuff like that. So, you must have a good fit for the show and you must do your research about the host and the procedure for getting guests on the show. Um, could, oh, the other thing I get a lot is, hello, um, my first book is coming out. Can I come on your podcast and talk about it again? where are the credentials from that person? Where is the value for my audience from a first time author? Unless it's somebody uh, who has built an amazing business in another way and their first book is telling um, people about that. So, you know, there may be situations, but someone who's just written their first novel is not necessarily going to be a good fit for the Creative Pen podcast, which is a, I'm aiming it to be a master's degree in, um, you know, in being an author, essentially. And the other thing is a personal connection is best. Uh, Those of you who listen to my show will know that um, I've often made friends with people on my podcast and then invited them back over time. I would much rather talk about a recent development um, with somebody who I know and we have a good rapport rather than having somebody brand new who I might struggle to, to develop a rapport with. So it's a It's an interesting balance when you're an interviewer and a host because you have to make it a conversation and some people, particularly authors, (laughs) can be difficult. So 
if you make a personal connection with a podcaster, that's always going to be the best way to get on a show. For example, take one of their courses, um, you know, listen regularly and, and um, tweet, uh, tweet their latest show, um, you know, share their show on social media, make sure you're noticed, meet them at a live event. And eventually, you know, becoming part of their community will mean, mean you are more likely to be invited at some point. So be useful to them and they are more likely to invite you on the show. Right, so I hope that you found this useful and that you've learned something you can use about audiobooks and or podcasting. And uh, you can get the slides, you can download the slides with all the links and I've got uh, some more links that are included in the slide pack at thecreativepen.com forward slash fringe 2016 with the password indie and that will take you to the download page. You can also get your free author 2.0 blueprint which talks about writing your publishing options, book marketing and making a living with your writing and uh, that is at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. So uh, you can also tweet me at thecreativepen or email me if you have any questions. So thanks for listening and I wish you all the best with your audio projects.